also the leader and founder of Black Alliance for Peace, which is a UNAC affiliated group. We can talk about elections. Um, so it's something I know we're all thinking about, um, how, how to relate our movement to the elections, and we'll see what the ideas are here, and we'll go right from there. Thank you, Joe, and good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to see everybody here this morning looking um, bright and restful and uh, ready for a very important day of, of conversation, engagement, uh, and hopefully effective uh, planning. We uh, hope to contribute to that process uh, with this conversation, a, a conversation we think is very uh, important. To talk about uh, the electoral, so-called electoral process, and to talk about um, the issue of democracy and how uh, the issues that we are concerned about, uh, militarism, war, uh, imperialism, can be access uh, can be made part of the of the national uh, discourse and why that's important and how we go about in fact doing that you know this issue of war and militarism has been one of the issues that so far as part of the um, Democrat Party process has been missing in action uh, I think a report came out that for the first uh, four or five debates, uh, they spent something like uh, 20 minutes max on discussing uh, U.S. foreign policy and connected to that this issue of U.S. Uh, interventionism and war, uh, which is interesting <coughs> because if you understand, we all understand this, the lion's share of the responsibility of the executive is connected to foreign policy. Um, and connected to that, of course, are these issues of U.S. intervention, uh, the war agenda. But yet, that very important, that lion's share of responsibility for the executive has not been discussed. Mainly, it's been the domestic issues, which ways become, becomes almost a, a diversion, if you will, uh, from the real uh, responsibility of the executive and the fact that, that the executive uh, is the place where the, the imperialist project, the imperialist agenda continues unabated. So we have to figure out in our movement how we try to reverse that and that's what we're going to uh, discuss. In 2016 um, it was addressed somewhat uh, with the surprising positions in some ways uh, by the uh, by uh, Donald Trump the surprise candidate uh, for many people because of course uh, he wasn't supposed to be a, uh, a serious candidate um, and what was interesting about 2016 and his candidacy and some of his positions well a lot of things were interesting but <laughs> one thing in particular was the attempt by the uh, Democrats to paint Donald Trump as this reckless uh, warmonger uh, because that's the popular perception of the, of the white man's party, the Republicans. Uh, but when Donald Trump was talking about the endless wars and the waste of the people's resources, it, it kind of helped to undermine uh, that attempt to try to uh, paint him in a certain kind of way. Uh, many people said, well, it wasn't serious. And of course, it wasn't serious in terms of his positions because once he won office, uh, we saw that uh, his real commitment to ending uh, U.S. war was uh, not that serious and was in fact undermined and we saw what happened with uh, the contrived attack on, on Syria. Uh, but what was important, and I think Glenn uh, touched on this yesterday, was the fact that uh, Trump could play with the idea uh, that the U.S. should be more mindful in its approach to uh, war and militarism and not suffer a negative consequence. It, it seemed that uh, the Trump folks recognized that uh, there was in fact in the country uh, war exhaustion, that people were tired of this ongoing war and that his base, those individuals who had been asked to redeploy uh, to Iraq and to Afghanistan over and over again, uh, 
the ones who were coming back uh, with PTSD and uh, committing suicide, uh, that uh, they were in fact tired of these endless wars. So we saw that that could happen. Unfortunately, the Democrat Party uh, didn't get that understanding uh, and they continued with, uh, or they transformed themselves in some ways in terms of the uh, public perception into the warmongering party. And that's important to note because um, if there is a conversation, and I think there will be, around these issues of war and militarism uh, going forward, it, it almost uh, suggests that uh, the Democrats are going to be forced, compelled, uh, to continue that, that track. Uh, we saw just recently that uh, the now front runner, uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, made some comments about a week ago that seemed uh, more than just reckless, but of course criminal, that he would support uh, preemptive strikes on um, North Korea and Iran um, to prevent them achieving or acquiring a nuclear weapon. Now that's problematic on so many different levels. Uh, and I won't go into it, we want to get into the other aspect of our conversation. But what we need to, to figure out as a movement is how we in fact uh, penetrate uh, the noise and the confusion to have these issues a place front and center uh, for the people to consider. So we have to talk about uh, how we access the, the process. Uh, where do we uh, prioritize our, our efforts? What level of government? Is it just the, the national level? Or do we um, uh, work also on the state and the local level? Um, what are the connecting issues that we need to raise up? Uh, what are the, the priority sectors of the population that we should target uh, for our, our work? And how do we undermine the, the moral um, arguments uh, that are put forward by the imperialist state uh, to justify their interventions and to justify their ongoing war agenda, like this issue of uh, humanitarian uh, intervention and this racist notion of uh, the responsibility to protect. So these are some of the, the questions that we need to think about. Uh, and I think think about these very seriously because for some of us, we believe that our movement has been quite remiss, almost irresponsible in that trying to tackle these kinds of questions uh, to almost become uh, spectators to this uh, uh, this season's electoral process uh, and not trying to figure out how we in fact address these questions and make sure that uh, our concerns, what are th which really are the concerns of the uh, U.S. population, uh, are part of the national discourse. So we need to, in the remaining months, um, try to figure out how we strategically address uh, this very important um, question, uh, this very important uh, sector of the electoral process uh, in order to advance our uh, peace, anti-war, and anti-imperialist agenda. To help us figure this out this morning, we have uh, two great uh, presenters. Uh, I'm just moderating this uh, discussion. We hope that we have a very vigorous and engaged uh, conversation. Um, first, to my immediate uh, left, uh, we have um, Andrea. No, Andrea. We have um, Andrew Bonificio. Adrian. Adrian. Adrian Bonificio. I always mess up these names, <laughs> even the simple okay. ones. Uh, from uh, Anak Banyan, yeah. um, who is an uh, organizer, an activist, uh, and someone who's going to bring, I think, very, very important um, um, issues and perspectives to the conversation. Uh, next, we have Margaret Kimberly. Uh, who we all know, of course, who is a, uh, the senior editor and columnist for uh, Black Agenda Report. Uh, she's on the uh, coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace, uh, the admin committee of UNAC, uh, and she has a wonderful uh, historic book out uh, that we all know about and we should make sure that we purchase and uh, let our friends and families know about. 
uh, she will be uh, closing out uh, the presentations. So without further ado, uh, let me turn this over to our next speaker. Thank you. Um, I have a presentation. There we go. Cool. Um, so like Ajamu mentioned, my name is Adrian Bonifacio. I'm with um, Anakbayan USA. It's a grassroots organization of Filipino youth and students fighting for national liberation in the Philippines and uh, genuine democracy, especially um, the democratic right to land for um, a majority of the Filipino people who remain in um, backward um, peasant conditions, feudal conditions. Um, and so I wanted to start things off by um, zooming out a bit, uh, talking about uh, peace and elections uh, more generally. What is the, the kind of framework we're, we're taking this from, at least as from, from Anak Bayan um, and the, uh, what we call the National Democratic Movement in the Philippines. Um, so just a question, what, what peace are we talking about, right? Um, and I wanted to pull from an example of um, one of the most important uh, elections in history. And it's um, uh, someone whose birthday, uh, the leader of which uh, we're celebrating soon, um, our good friend, um, Vladimir Lenin. There's a picture of Vladimir Lenin on my slide, but you can't see him. You can't see him, but he's, he's among us today. Um, and uh, do people remember his, his famous slogan, the slogan of, of the party then, peace, land, bread, right? Um, peace, um, to uh, power to the Soviets, land to the peasants, peace to the nations, and bread to the starving. And so when we think about peace, it is something that, um, oh, with to the rescue. Um, when we talk about peace, it's something that, um, you know, is not just about um, the absence of just militarism, the absence of um, things like that, but the, the absence of uh, all forms of war that um, people have been talking about this entire weekend, whether it's sanctions, um, famine as a tool of war, rape as a tool of war, um, and it also means that uh, people have food to eat, people have uh, the land that they're due, right? Uh, and then the people are in power, right? The majority is in power. Um, and so um, this, the October Revolution, right? We celebrated the 100 year anniversary a couple years ago. Um, it's Lenin's 150th birthday uh, this year in April. Happy birthday, Lenin, wherever in the spirit of the masses. Um, but, um, yeah, in, in the, also, yeah, in the Kremlin wall. Um, but um, it, in terms of this election, it was an election of, of the masses against imperialism, against capitalism. Um, and not just in the ballots, but on the streets. Um, they were fighting a revolutionary war, um, and they elected to overthrow capitalism, right? Um, and that's how they achieved peace. And so um, I wanted to uh, frame it in that first so that um, for Anak Bayan, we um, know that elections are a time to um, put on the national stage the issues that the people care about, right? Um, the, the, the issues of um, water, the issues of land, the issues of food, the issues of healthcare, of education. Um, and at the same time, we know that um, elections in a bourgeois democracy isn't gonna get us the peace that we ultimately want. Um, and so we're, we're touting that line, right? Um, but um, it is an important space for us to um, occupy, no? Um, and the second question um, I wanted to ask is peace for whom, right? Um, Ajamu opened it up with saying uh, that there's a lot of uh, diversion of um, domestic policy. What are people's um, plans to alleviate the healthcare crisis here, education, um, jobs, the economy, environment, right? Um, and um, I wanted to uh, put up another quote. I like quotes because they're short and pithy and people remember them. Um, of another famous revolutionary, um, Franz Fanon. Um, and he um, said that, uh, I'll read the quote, Latin America, China, and Africa, from all these continents under whose eyes Europe today raises her tower of opulence, there has flowed out for centuries toward that same Europe, diamonds and oil, silk and cotton, wood and exotic products. Europe is literally the creation of the third world. The wealth which smothers her is that which was stolen from the underdeveloped peoples. Um, and so I want us to remember this, um, during this election cycle too, um, for the, the same reasons that Ajamu was mentioning, that we can't talk about domestic policy, we can't talk about free health care for all, free education for all, canceling all student debt, if, if it's funded on the backs of um, the exploited and oppressed around the world. Um, we can't just talk about how Michael Bloomberg um, 
uh, this just came out too, that he used uh, prison labor for his campaign calls. Um, yeah, that's a new development, uh, or maybe an old development. Um, but we, uh, and then we can't at the same time celebrate people who are, are using the prison labor of the global south for, um, for the welfare of um, the United States, the people here. Um, and so um, that's another uh, framing that I wanted to give. Um, so um, in terms of elections, right, if we're talking about elections, foreign policy, uh, the different uh, positions of candidates, we know that um, there's not much choice, right, in terms of the foreign policy uh, positions of both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, whether it's in terms of militarism, uh, economic violence abroad, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and another quote, it's like every other slide is a quote, um, our friend Marx, right? Um, the oppressed are allowed once every few years to decide which particular representatives of the oppressing class are to represent and repress them. Um, so much for a choice, right? Um, and you know, this, is, this, is, this came up so much in uh, the 2016 election about people who uh, were debating about, oh, it's okay to choose between the lesser of two evils. I mean, this is what Marx was talking about, right? Um, the lesser of two evils just means like who will, what, what face do you want to repress you more? Um, and so it's uh, an opportunity for us, right, um, in knowing the character of both the Democratic and the Republican Party, um, how are we exposing and opposing um, the ways that each party continues to uh, push policies of repression, not just here in the states, but abroad, right? Um, we know that um, between the Democratic and the Republican parties, there's been a long history of uh, uh, violence against the people, whether it's uh, militarism, war, you know, Johnson, the Vietnam War, right after Nixon unleashed his war on drugs. Um, Clinton uh, signed NAFTA in quick succession, Bush signed CAFTA for, for um, Central America and the Caribbean, right? Um, Obama was the deporter in chief, and we have Trump building concentration camps um, across the, the border with Mexico. Um, so we know that this is, you know, this is just a history. This is the United States history between the two parties that we have. Um, the war in Afghanistan, um, for those who read that, um, you know, for all of its uh, uh, bourgeois and misleading propaganda, the Washington Post put out the, the Afghanistan papers. Um, the other month, um, but it kind of got clouded out by the impeachment, all that impeachment business. Um, and so um, the war in Afghanistan, over 150,000 people dead, mostly civilians, uh, many of them um, women and children, over a trillion dollars spent, right? This is enough to, to cancel all student debt in the country, was spent on a pointless war in Afghanistan. Um, and that was uh, led by both the Democratic and Republican parties under Bush, Obama, Trump, and into the foreseeable future, right? Um, and then speaking about the impeachment, I mean, this is what happened during the impeachment, right, where the, the parties were furiously at war with each other. Um, but in the meantime, they're able to pass um, and shake hands across the aisle on a, a defense spending bill that's the largest we've ever seen. Um, it's a defense spending bill that uh, allowed, gave, um, gave Trump kind of the blanket okay to, to, for the airstrikes that happened. It gave him the okay for, to use military funds for the border wall. Um, and then at the same time, um, the successor of NAFTA was finally signed and actually championed by uh, Nancy Pelosi um, as a, kind of an achievement of uh, what the parties can do even if uh, there's this whole impeachment thing going on. Um, so even in election cycle, even if it seems like uh, bitter enemies to the death, they're still able to uh, pass the, the material basis for the oppression of the world, right? Of all of us, right? Um, and uh, this is a great graphic. This is a very sad graphic. Um, how much of your life uh, has the US been at war? Um, so for people who were born um, in 2001, I don't know if anyone here uh, was born in 2001 or, or later, congratulations. Um, your whole life, uh, the US has been at war, um, which is um, unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate uh, reality. Uh, but what well, you notice here is that even from 1915, the beginning of this chart, um, more than a third of people's life has been at war. Um, and it's something that has been hidden, right, from, from public view um, because uh, people don't talk about foreign policy, right? During election cycles, they don't talk about uh, what will you do about the, the troops abroad? What will you do about um, 
continuing war, why, why do you feel like we should still be intervening in these other countries? It's not, it's not a, a topic of discussion, right? Unless um, there's some you know, charades that, that happened in, in 16 with Trump saying the endless wars, you know? Um, but even then, they didn't stop, right? Um, and so I wanted to talk about the impacts on the Philippines. Um, as, a, as a Filipino organization, we've felt uh, the brunt of what it means to have uh, two war parties being elected in, in succession, one after the other, right? Um, if people were here on Friday, Berna of, of uh, Bayan USA gave a great presentation about uh, the role of US imperialism in the Philippines. Um, and it was um, uh, in 1899, uh, the US's first imperialist war abroad, what a lot of people call the first Vietnam. It's where tor the, the torture tactics of the United States were first practiced, waterboarding, um, uh, indiscriminate killing of, of youth. Um, there, there's a famous um, order that a general said that um, uh, kill everyone um, over 10. Um, was, and they called it the Howling Fields of Samar, uh, which is an island in the Philippines, because they thought that anyone over 10 would be old enough to carry arms um, and rebel against uh, the US military coming in. Um, but you can see here, the blue is when Democratic parties were in power, the red is when uh, there were Republican parties. Actually, a majority of them are blue. Um, and um, uh, the US bases were kicked out because of a mass movement. Um, there was a mass protest on the street that forced the Senate to uh, not renew the bases agreement in the United States. But soon after that, um, the United States government was able to um, find, find loopholes. And so this next graphic is um, after the bases were kicked out, um, the military is still all over the country, right? And this is something that has been championed um, by uh, the different parties. Uh, of course, Hillary Clinton had her famous um, uh, pivot to Asia, uh, which listed uh, the Philippines and other countries in Asia, Southeast Asia, as the new um, turning point, kind of, for um, uh, America's foreign policy. So, you know, none of the, the, de the candidates um, in the Democratic primaries have even mentioned anything about uh, their, their policies um, in continuing the Asia pivot, in, in abating it, or, or so on and so forth. Um, and just a last uh, uh, fact that since 2016, um, almost or over, over half a billion dollars has gi been given in military aid, police aid. Different panelists have been mentioning the Philippines. Um, it's, um, the drug war is probably the, the biggest thing that's in the international news. Over 30,000 people have been killed. Uh, mostly poor, without due process, gunned down in the streets, summarily executed. Um, and meanwhile, the, um, the drug lords are still in power, right? Um, and so I, we could do a whole other presentation about um, peace and elections in the Philippines um, and, and the lack of democracy there. Um, but this is what um, happens when we elect war parties, right? This is the, some of the, the material impacts uh, of what happens when we're not able to push agendas for peace. Um, um, to candidates, right? Um, there have been different uh, folks we've been working with who are trying to put the Philippines on um, Bernie Sanders' platform. What, what would you say about um, the hundreds of millions going to the Philippines, funding the drug war, funding other things, um, and there's uh, been nothing? He had like a tweet about it maybe, but you know. Other, other presidents, famous people have tweets too, and that, that hasn't gotten us anywhere. Um, and so I wanted to close things out um, with um, just talking about making peace uh, a campaign for the masses, right? Um, we are in a period where um, we can use the issue of um, the, the people, right? Whether it's access to water, access to healthcare, education, and there's a stage for us, right? Uh, in terms of this, this current election cycle, to put it um, there. But Knowing the character of, of the Democratic Party, knowing the character of the Republican Party, no matter who's going to win, right, whether it's um, th uh, the fascist again or another neoliberal candidate, um, we know that war will be part of their agenda. And so more primary for Anak Bayan, and I'm sure many of our organizations uh, that, are, that are here today, is uh, creating a mass movement. How can we use this issue, um, this time, to create a mass movement, to create mass campaigns um, that can be sustained so that we're not falling into the trap of uh, NGOism, of the nonprofit industrial complex, where the only time where we go on the streets is to, to do um, uh, for, for ballot measures or for, for um, canvassing of candidates, electoral candidates, and then suddenly you have no base. Uh, after that, every four years, you don't have a base anymore. You have to do the work over again, um, because we know that um, 
this is, this is an important time for us to actually build mass movement and to sustain it, right? To show people that um, we can push um, things forward and then when the electeds fail, that um, it gives them even more fire to continue fighting and to continue fighting for more revolutionary demands than just um, to have someone that looks like them in office or someone who can talk like them in office, right? Um, and so, um, I also wanted to relate it to how can we make peace a campaign for uh, the youth as well, since a lot of people have been asking, how do we organize the youth? Um, so Anak Vine is a youth and student organization, um, right? We know that the youth is a, a powerful uh, force in history that needs to be organized, that every social movement, um, uh, Frank yesterday mentioned that you know every social movement is from the, th from the bottom up, and every social movement that has been successful needs to uh, be able to successfully mobilize the youth uh, in partnership with the, the most exploited and oppressed, the working class, in, in the case of the Philippines, the, the peasant farmers. Um, and so how we do that, right, is um, through organization. This is another Lenin quote. Um, he, he just said, organization, 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 right? Uh, and many other revolutionaries have, have uh, also taken this line. Ho Chi Minh uh, also uh, um, promoted this um, during the, the Vietnam War. Um, in that we, Kwame Ture, right? Um, we can't have um, a, a mass movement if we don't have mass organizations, right? Um, we can't uh, fight an enemy. We can't fight the, the parties that are currently organizing um, because we should recognize that these reactionary parties are organizing on their own, right? The, the DNC is currently organizing how they're going to uh, fathom to topple Bernie Sanders' um, uh, growing popularity, especially right after he won Nevada. Um, the Republican Party is organizing how they're going to keep Trump in power. Um, if we're not organizing into solid organization, then um, we let the opportunity for the enemy to take uh, uh, victory from us, right? And so we have to remember this quote. And um, for the youth in particular, um, uh, another quote, um, this year, 2020, is the 50th anniversary of what's called the first quarter storm in the Philippines. And the first quarter storm was a period of mass upheaval um, that took um, uh, 10 years beforehand of painstaking organizing work, right? And so when we talk about um, these flashpoints in history, right, like an elections year, we need to understand, again, in, in terms of making this a mass movement, a mass campaign, that we need to be doing the work well before elections year and then well after uh, into the next cycle so that we can use these trigger points to um, uh, have an upsurge, right, in, in our mass movement building and to actually promote the, the issues and, and hold people accountable uh, to what we want. And so this is from um, a Filipino uh, revolutionary, Jose Maria Sison. Um, he said, um, the unfulfilled aspiration of the nation and the masses throb in the hearts and minds of the young. This generation strives to recoup the failures of the past and girds for the triumphs of the future. Only through militant struggle can the best in the youth emerge. Um, and so this is what a lot of the, the, the young uh, speakers yesterday and the, the people in the audience were, were talking about, is that we need to trust, trust the youth and trust their militant aspirations um, because we know that um, uh, for youth, the number one enemy uh, of them, whether they know it or not, is imperialism and fascism. And why is that? It's because they have some of the most to lose from their future being taken away from them, right? Um, and so um, in terms of building mass movement, we need to engage the youth um, and we need to engage them in organization, right? Um, and so that's where um, I want to talk a little bit about Anak Bayan. Um, so this is from our latest Congress. Uh, we, we hold it every three years. Um, and some of the campaigns that we do to engage the youth and in terms of uh, peace and elections, we have a campaign, Take Back Our Education, People First, Not Profit in War. Um, and this is a campaign that uh, we really wanted to um, be able to put on to connect the issues of peace at home, but also abroad, uh, link it to the, really, uh, the lived realities of the youth, um, and then uh, have it be under an anti-imperialist framework. So we know that the youth um, are suffering from an education crisis, right? Student debt is the, qu the fastest growing debt, over a trillion dollars now. Um, and there's so many other factors of the education crisis, right? There's uh, food insecurity, there's homelessness. Um, I, I live in San Jose in the, in the Bay Area, and one of the, the biggest stories was that the, the San Jose Student Council, their, their student president, um, after she graduated, so this is the, the Associated Students Body, she came out as, um, uh, homeless, um, that for the entire period that she was serving as the president of the entire student body, she was living out of her car, 
right? And she was just too embarrassed to share that. Um, and meanwhile, across from the campus, they're building luxury condominiums for the students there, right? Um, and so um, the the presidential candidates right now might be talking about all those things, right? They might be talking about um, education, they might be talking about uh, food security, homelessness, um, but how are they talking about it in an anti-imperialist framework, which is where we have to push, right? Um, which is where this, this campaign came into, um, the, the first demand is really to end um, uh, funding for wars of aggression and militarism, right? And how is that related to, um, yeah, funding for what we, uh, what the people need here, right? Um, it, and then we had several other demands to stopping privatization and commercialization, uh, making uh, public ed education free. In terms of number four, ending campus repression. This is uh, uh, during a time when the sanctuary campus movement was, was going on. There's a lot of um, police brutality happening uh, on campuses. Um, I recently spoke at uh, UC Santa Cruz where there's a graduate student strike ongoing right now to increase the cost of living and uh, the police are just pigs there. I mean, they're, they're uh, detaining and, and harassing people uh, every day. Um, this third point, implementing pro-people, culturally relevant education, um, you know, the, the fight for ethnic studies, you might say, um, for an anti-imperialist education. I also wanted to spend a little time on this just because um, um, people were talking about identity politics throughout the weekend as, as a kind of um, that needs to be countered against. And I just want to say that, especially for youth organizing um, and uh, organizing youth of color, it's actually a very um, prime place to start, right? Just as elections is a very prime place to start, even though it's, it's couched in a bourgeois um, um, framework, no? In that people are... Um, struggling, especially for Filipinos, struggling to figure out who they are. They feel alienated from their culture. They don't know why they're here. Um, and so there's that uh, contradiction. There's that crisis in, in their culture that, that um, um, pushes them to want to create social organizations or, or fight for, for cultural things like ethnic studies. And our task as organizers is not to shame them for that. It's to, um, it's to link and raise those to um, the political and economic crisis, right? Um, it's not that they are, um, you know, feeling lost or like wondering, like, oh, what more is there to Filipino culture than like uh, lumpia and like pancit? Um, that's just um, a, a fact of um, um, imperialism actively taking that culture from them, right? And so we have to link that too. Um, and during this election cycle, that's uh, an opportunity as well, right? Um, uh, how can we ensure that? The candidates are not just pandering to you know cultural um, aspects of of the bodies that they're trying to uh, get the vote from, whether it's the Asian vote, the Black vote, the Latino vote, and they'll say all these things to try to be relatable. But are they talking about the material conditions that are are uh, putting these communities into crisis every day, right? Whether at home or abroad, um, and so um, we link and raise these issues right to the broader issue of war. Um, and, and militarism abroad. So at the same time, while Anak Bain has uh, uh, campaigns like this that really speak to domestic issues, we have issues that speak to um, the relationship between U.S. imperialism and the Philippines. So one of our biggest campaigns is to overthrow um, a very fascist dictator in the Philippines. His name is Rodrigo Duterte. Um, he's the one at the, the, hand, the helm of the drug war. He's at the helm of uh, numerous counterinsurgency programs that have militarized the entire state. Um, that have um, even have international departments now. So um, a lot of us in this room have been uh, tagged as terrorists, uh, have been uh, doxxed already um, by agents of uh, Duterte. And um, they're sending um, people abroad to go on fake tours, uh, talking about like the plight of indigenous people when the indigenous people they sell are, uh, uh, when the indigenous people they send are sellouts to their culture, they uh, allow mining corporations and, and the like to um, invade ancestral lands um, for their own private wealth. Um, and so um, people talked about different forms of struggle um, over the weekend and so um, being in the classrooms, right? Um, this is when uh, we held our own tour of indigenous leaders who are fighting for their self-determination in a genuine way, right? We have um, opportunities for legislative work. Um, we had a mass mobilization in, in DC to do not just lobbying, but um, uh, um, uh, mass action in front of uh, the Capitol building. And then of course we have our, our mass actions, right? Um, to to highlight the, the relationship between US imperialism and, and um, uh, the Philippines, which is something that we're pushing in this election cycle in particular is 
what are candidates' positions on um, ending U.S. support of fascism in the Philippines? And how can we make that part of candidates' uh, platforms, right? Um, there are very few candidates, if at all, that have foreign policy, their foreign policy platforms on their, their websites or even in the debates, right? Um, you know, 20 minutes only, right? Um, and so uh, of that 20 minutes, you know, you could spread that 20 minutes to a million different um, issues of foreign policy abroad. Um, how are we able to push um, the Philippines as one of uh, the U.S.'s first colonies um, and one of its strongest puppet regimes in, in, in the uh, Asia Pacific as one of the things that they talk about, right? Uh, as a way to promote the struggles there, as a, a way to do um, united front work among, uh, among folks who are engaged in this arena of struggle. Um, and so um, this is on the U.S. side, um, but the F Anak Bayan and, and national democratic organizations here are also linked uh, to to the Filipino movement back home. Um, and um, I, I really appreciated the, the panel on regime, the, the workshop on regime change yesterday because we got to hear from people who, who face the brunt of what our elections do, right? Um, every four years we have the opportunity to see um, what the, the future of our country will look like and the danger is to have the narrow-minded view of just thinking it impacts the people living in the states without thinking about um, the, the billions of other people it'll impact abroad. Um, and so when, when uh, we elected Trump, um, we meaning like the, the American people, and I, I don't think anyone here, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe, maybe, and then you've like found the light of revolution. <laughs> uh, no, no judgment, right? Um, but um, what does that mean for, for people, right? And so when Trump was elected, um, the Philippines had massive protests against Trump, right? It wasn't just the states that was protesting Trump. And so I want to uh, flash some pictures from um, uh, the ban the, uh, banned Trump in the Philippines protests when he visited for um, uh, the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations um, conference. Uh, so this is, this is um, what happened, the confrontation between the police and the protesters. Um, um, and, um, you know, very militant uh, struggles of the youth in particular. These, these people are from Anakbayan in the Philippines. Um, and um, some of the, the tactics that the police used were uh, sound cannons, uh, water cannons. These were the same, the very same equipment that were used in Standing Rock um, that, were, that are being used uh, in Israel, right? And so we can see um, uh, the connections there as well. Um, but to, to show the, the militancy of the, um, the Filipino movement against U.S. imperialism, right? Because for them, peace means U.S. imperialism out, right? Plain and simple. Um, and so this is them, uh, a short clip of um, them breaking through the police line, right? And so these are, these are youth students, these are peasant farmers who mobilized to, uh, to uh, condemn Trump. These are workers in the factories who are striking, who are not backing down, even in the face of um, water cannons, in the face of sound cannons. Um, there are people, I was just talking with people yesterday, there are people whose eardrums were burst because of the water cannons um, jutting uh, directly into their ears, and uh, they didn't relent, right? And so when we think about how hard we have to struggle here in the United States, in the belly of the beast, uh, Let's just remember that um, people around the world in the oppressed colonies and neo-colonies are struggling um, harder 10 times over than us, right? Because they're the ones who are at the brunt of um, these decisions. And so this is what's at stake, right? In terms of making peace an election issue, this is what's at stake, not just in the Philippines, but around the world, right? Where um, um, people are, 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 are fighting. Uh, to the bone. Um, and, and just to close up, the, the last thing I wanted to mention um, in terms of people fighting uh, is a, a different uh, form of struggle. So this is a map of the Philippines for folks who don't know what the Philippines look like. Um, can anyone guess what um, the red means? So there, there are some things shaded in red. Can anyone guess? Military bases? Kind of. Militarism? People's army. Um, this is, there, the Philippines has the longest running uh, armed revolution in the Asia Pacific, uh, going um, 51 years. Um, and so there, these are uh, military 
uh, quote unquote bases, but these are all the provinces, 74 out of the 81 provinces in the Philippines are uh, where the People's Army is based. Um, and so it's not just um, people who are fighting in the streets, but people who are taking up um, armed uh, revolution to build governments where they can actually achieve genuine elections. Um, they can have elections of the people from these communities, right? Um, and um, they're fighting for, for peace, right? Um, there is a slogan that um, was held during the 50th anniversary of the Communist Party of the Philippines, uh, People's War for People's Peace, right? Um, and it's um, something that for folks who know the, the lyrics of the international, um, this is the, the Filipino version, um, this quote, ito'y huling paglalaban, it means this is the final fight, right? And so for, for revolutionaries around the world um, that are engaging in armed revolution uh, for socialism against imperialism, it's because they believe that um, it is on the path to waging the final fight for peace, right? To no longer take up arms because they are finding a way to fight exploitation and they're taking that agency into their own hands. Um, and so I just wanted to close off uh, with a video. Um, and it's a video that um, is going to be uh, part of um, a movie project um, that uh, uh, different Filipino organizers are doing to highlight um, the, um, the story of some of the pioneers of the Philippine Revolution. Um, and it's called Moving the Mountains. Um, and um, this is a video that was, uh, uh, the, the interviewers asked uh, fighters in, in the countryside and uh, in the cities, what would you say to the people who started the revolution um, 50 years ago? Um, and so, just to close things out. Ang nagpadayon ka ron ng mga katigulangan. So, dako gyud ang among pagpasalamat sa ilaha. Kay sila ang nagpadayon o kami sad ang nakasunod. Ang usunod pa gyud ang mga kaliwatan. Tungod sa ilang pagrebolusyon na daghan ilang mga napasulod diri nga mga kabatan-unan. Nagpadayan pa sila bisag tigulang na ano. Na napagmi nga, sumusunod nga. Ang sa ako raman, sa mga tigulang na, tigulang na masad ko. <laughs> Napagi tigulang sa ako. <laughs> ang panawagan na ako, nga dili giyod man, dili maghuyang. Kay mao na ipanukaran sa mga sumusunod labi na sa mga batan on kay kasi nati anak ko kung tanan ra batan on wa sila ay mahimo nga uh, tan aunon ba nga uy tigulan na pero okay pa modelo nga ko ra man nga padayong gyud ang mga tigulan saludo ko sa mga mga tao sa mga kauban nga nanigulang na dinhi sa revolusyon kay tibuok kinabuhi og determinasyon nga hangtod sa pagkakaron ana apa nga ni asdang ay saludo pulang <laughs> saludo mga kasama <laughs> salamat salamat sa kanila dahil sa gidanan tindi ng pag uusig sa kanila ng panahon nila nagawa pa rin nilang maitaguyod ang partido ang wala nang bagyo pambabagyo ng militar sa kanayunan Narito pa rin tayo, pinagpapatuloy ang revolusyon. At uh, bilang kabataan, kami po yung mga apo ng matandang hangal na nagpapatag ng bundok na ipagpapatuloy ang kanilang mga nasimulan. Hindi po ito para sa amin, ito po ay para sa susunod sa amin. Kami po yung buhay na patunay na ang revolusyon ay hindi pa rin patay. Na ang revolusyon, ay buhay at nagpapatuloy ito at magtatagumpay ito. Dahil pabagsak na po ang kapitalismo, oras naman para sumulat ng panibagong kwento. Isang kwento ng tagumpay. Kwento ng pagkibaka ng kabataan. Hindi kwento ng pagtitiis at pagtatago. Hindi kwento ng pagpikit. Hindi kwento ng pagbibingi-bingihan. Hindi kwento ng mga mulat na nakikibaka. Maaari nilang bunutin ng isang bulaklak, pero hindi, hindi nila mapipigilan ng flexible. Maaaring maging malamig, mahaba, at masalimuot ang gabi. 
Pero darating ang araw na sisikat mula sa silangan ang mapulang araw ng ating kalayaan. And that is it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Organize, organize, organize. Black Alliance for Peace, we are absolutely clear. We understand that without justice, there will be no peace. And for justice, you have to fight for it. So we don't advocate an abstract peace. We understand that for us to be able to make progress, we have to struggle. And struggle for liberation by any means necessary. So thank you so much for that presentation. So next we have um, Margaret Kimberly. We've already intro Margaret. Um, she's going to uh, bring it home. Thank you. Thank you, Jamu. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And power to the people. Power, power to the people. people. Power to the people. Power to the people. All right. Um, I think uh, uh, the, the title of our panel is pretty self-explanatory. And we need, we must raise the issue of war and imperialism in electoral politics in this country, not just presidential elections, not just every four years. Um, this weekend, we've uh, said over and over again that we're an anti-imperialist, anti-war group of people. But that's meaningless if we don't use what, uh, what's left of the democratic uh, electoral process to advocate for our cause. Um, we can't behave as though foreign policy is off limits uh, just because they do that. The uh, uh, recent debates where foreign policy is discussed very little, and then when it is, they all sound the same. Even those who are supposed to be progressive sound the same. Um, other forces do this. They do this all the time. Last night, uh, many of us were here. We saw the very moving film about Gaza. Um, and I, I watched it, it was interesting because I, there were some new facts for me, but not really. I was aware of the suffering of the people there, that Gaza is a, a prison for a couple million people, um, that people are denied the ability to leave for any reason, that they've been deprived of electricity, that the, the horrible, um, uh, I would just call it a massacre in 2014, and uh, at that time, Michael Bloomberg is in the news, uh, so I'll bring him up. Uh, he was mayor of New York City at the time. And he did not just express support for the Israeli government. He flew to Israel, had a press conference with Netanyahu, and declared that the people of New York City were with Israel. Uh, he didn't ask me. I was not with Israel, and I'm sure uh, many of the 8 million other New Yorkers were not either. But uh, this continues, this support for Israel in Congress. Um, uh, the fact that we have, uh, I guess Trump is the most open about doing what Israel wants, but it's not really new. Uh, but there is pressure on elected officials. And not just federal officials either, not just members of uh, Congress. There have been a number of laws, including here in New York State, which basically makes um, BDS, um, uh, Boycott Divestment Sanctions Against Israel, basically makes it illegal. Um, uh, any organization that advocates for BDS will be deprived of uh, funding from government. Individuals who participate in BDS uh, face all sorts of uh, personal sanctions. There are states that have, they have laws that say uh, you can't, Georgia among other Texas, uh, people have fought against them, thank goodness. But this is, uh, these are examples of what other people are doing in uh, the realm of uh, foreign policy issues and uh, uh, the issues of concern to them 
in uh, politics across the country. Uh, here in New York, there's a huge parade, I think it's in June, a Salute to Israel parade. Every elected official turns out, everybody who wants to be an elected official turns out. Um, we have uh, uh, Venezuela is being made a, uh, an elected, um, an issue in elections here for Florida. It's always been for Cuba with their large um, uh, anti-Cuban uh, uh, population. And now uh, Venezuela has been added to the pot. So people pander to them uh, in order to get elected. So this is, to, to make a long story short, this is not new. Other people do it. We can do it too. Uh, at, that's our goal at Black Agenda Report. This is uh, uh, something that the, uh, the black community uh, used to do um, more forcefully. I mean, many things have changed. That's a whole s uh, story for a whole other panel. But uh, we always led in um, uh, an anti-imperialist point of view in foreign policy in this country. And uh, that is what BAP is resurrecting. And we have many campaigns uh, to do just that. Uh, at Black Agenda Report, we have made note of this. Uh, last year, we had um, Alicia Garza, who's one of the, known as one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, and she's a, an operative for the Democratic Party. She carried out something called the Black Census Project, a survey of, I think, 30,000 people, some huge number of people, and no question about foreign policy. None were whatsoever. So uh, one of our campaigns, and the, oh, there it is, good. Uh, that's a map of Africa, and uh, the red dots show where there are U.S. military bases uh, on the continent. The ones that we know of, actually, um, this is, uh, it's unclear where they are. They keep them secret. Uh, a few years ago when uh, uh, U.S. soldiers were killed in Niger, there were members of Congress who said they didn't know we had troops in Niger. And I actually were telling the truth. I don't, I don't think they, they uh, were aware that there are U.S., um, that there are U.S. bases all over the continent and um, uh, military, U.S. military all over the African continent. This, as many of you are also involved in the uh, campaign to uh, close all U.S. foreign military base, some 800 all over the world. And these are um, those in uh, uh, on the African continent. This is part of AFRICOM, U.S. Africa Command, which came into being at the tail end of uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush, Bush 43's administration, but was really kicked into high gear by Obama. This is uh, Obama's map more than it is uh, George Bush's map. Uh, so as um, we've uh, talked about already, uh, uh, imperialism is quite bipartisan. We don't have, uh, among the duopoly, an anti-war voice. And we see it quite plainly. A couple of weeks ago, we had the State of the Union address. And this was, um, this was proof. Juan Guaido was there. He was on a worldwide tour. The man that the United States has chosen to be the president of Venezuela. He's been in Europe. He was in Canada. He was at uh, the State of the Union address. And Nancy Pelosi, who allegedly hates Trump so much and ripped up his speech, she jumped up and applauded when, uh, when Guaido was there. Uh, the sanctions war, uh, as we discussed yesterday, the sanctions being war by other means that... Uh, are just as deadly as bullets and bombs, 40,000 Venezuelans dead. This is not an issue in the presidential campaign. Instead, we uh, see silence, or even those who are allegedly progressive, uh, going along with what Obama started and Trump ramped up. Uh, but I, I have to say something about Guaido. If you've, if you've not seen it, have you seen any of the footage of him going back home to Caracas? Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't, you've got to look for this online. Uh, if, you, if there was any doubt that the people don't want him, 
Uh, he was attacked by a mob. His wife was attacked. There is uh, footage of her people uh, beating him up, some women beating him up. I said, uh, well, never mind. I, I won't go there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, that is something that I wish uh, everyone could see uh, because it shows what... Um, uh, what the United States is doing to this country, the violence against this country that we choose to put this man in power, uh, try to put him in power, thank God not successfully yet, and uh, his people, the people there do not want him and they've suffered a lot, they're going hungry, they're dying for lack of medical care, going without power, all sorts of things in order for the U.S. to uh, try to thwart the will of the people there. So lately we've seen a uh, uh, return of, uh, of Russiagate. And Russiagate holds so much power in, in part because uh, the left has had failed to speak up against it. Russiagate is a tool of, uh, it was all started by Hillary Clinton and her friends in the CIA and the NSA in her failed attempt to keep Donald Trump out of office. And they have since used it to silence, to censor people like us at Black Agenda Report. We've ended up on one of those lists, the proper not list of uh, people who are allegedly Russian dupes. Um, after two years of investigation, the Mueller investigation, what did they conclude? Uh, who was indicted for colluding with Russia? Nobody. Uh, the most they came up with was Facebook ads. They came claimed that uh, people stayed home in Michigan because of uh, Vladimir Putin was willing to spend like $50,000 on Facebook ad. <laughs> but, but anyway, but Russiagate is back and the same people who started it are, uh, have revved it up again uh, so this week we're told that uh, the Russians are again interfering in the election on behalf of Donald Trump and also on behalf of Bernie Sanders, who goes along with these things. And I, I think one of, the, one of the things we have to stop doing is letting him or anybody else off the hook because they domestically may uh, be in favor of some... Uh, progressive policies, things that we want to see, and also because they're being, especially uh, Sanders, being beaten up by people we hate, and that can uh, cause us to overlook things that we should not overlook. And uh, so uh, what does he, what did he say? I'll read this quote. Um, Unlike Donald Trump, I do not consider Vladimir Putin a good friend. He's an author autocratic thug who's attempting to destroy democracy and crush dissent in Russia. Let's be clear, the Russians want to undermine American democracy by dividing us and uh, dividing us up. And unlike the current president, I stand firmly against their efforts and any other foreign power that uh, wants to interfere in our uh, election. Um, in 2016, Russia used internet propaganda to sow division. Um, so uh, on and on, I, I'll, uh, I won't read the whole thing. But uh, this is an example of what we deal with if we don't speak up and if we don't put people on notice that they can't get away with this stuff and still get our support, no matter what else they want to do. We can't um, uh, go along with this notion that foreign policy is some kind of a frill and that it can be dispensed with in uh, elections. So, uh, so who do we have among the, I mean, we know where Trump stands. He's been, whatever he said in 2016, we know what he's done as president. So uh, we're looking at the Democrats to see where they stand on foreign policy. And uh, uh, Tulsi Gabbard gets credit. She says she's opposed to re regime change wars, and that's a good thing. I'm, I'm glad she says that. But the way she frames it, uh, she's always in uniform and she's always posing and it's always, I, I was looking at her website, quote, in 2004 as Tulsi was campaigning for re-election to the State House, the 29th Brigade combat team was called up and began preparing to deploy to Iraq. Tulsi's name was not on the mandatory deployment roster, but she knew there was no way she could stay behind in beautiful Hawaii as her brothers and sisters were sent off to war. 
So it's an anti-war but pro-war statement. When she talks about war, she talks about what happened to American troops. She doesn't, uh, I haven't heard, if anybody has, let me know, her uh, make reference to the million Iraqis who uh, were killed by the United States. So this is a sort of thing we have to watch out for and we can't less let pass without comment. And I wanted to talk about some of the things that uh, many people have let pass. These are some things that uh, Bernie Sanders said to um, the New York Times uh, when they all have to meet with the New York Times and they endorsed the queer, weird thing, Warren and what's her name? What's the crazy lady? Klobuchar. Yeah. Uh, so he was asked, sorry. I'm sorry, I can't take her seriously. And he was asked if he would consider military force to preempt an Iranian or North Korea nuclear or, or missile test. And he said yes, he would. And that's just what George Bush did, this preemptive war, this claim that the United States has the right to um, read other countries' minds and say what they're doing or to tell outright lies, which is generally what happens. Uh, he said he would consider military force for a humanitarian intervention. Well, every U.S. intervention is said to be humanitarian. The uh, U.S. is always killing people and claiming it's for their own good. They're helping them out some kind of way. So that doesn't mean anything. He says, well, there's evidence he was involved in acts of terror. No, there aren't. Uh, he supported attacks on troops in Iraq. No, he didn't. Uh, but the question isn't, was he a bad guy, but does his assassinating him make America safer? The answer is no, that we're not safer. So what would he do? Make the claim that we are safer and do the same thing? Um, uh, so it goes on and on and on. It's, and then this was, the actual, to me, the lowest point uh, this week when this, this new ginned up Russiagate story came along and he goes along with this tale of Russian interference. But then he went on to say, threw his own people under the bus, instead of defending him, all these charges that his supporters are somehow worse than other people and meaner on Twitter. And, uh, but then he said that some of it could have come from Russian bots and not from his supporters. It was, I, I felt it was a, a low point. But uh, uh, if you could show the next image, please. So I wanted to talk about, thank you, what we're doing at Black Alliance for Peace. This is our candidate uh, pledge that, uh, and some couple people signed it this weekend, that's great. We are making good on our, our concern and we are asking candidates to pledge that they will cut the military budget by 50%, among other things. Um, <laughs> close AFRICOM. Uh, you know, we, So this is what we are we are are doing to make uh, to make good on this because as I was pointing out, uh, uh, there are other issues where people at every level of government are asked to go along with the demands of certain groups, and we are um, definitely sticking with uh, putting our money where our mouths are, and in our campaign, uh, asking elected officials and candidates for office to sign our pledge. And this is uh, something that uh, we are uh, committed to continuing to do so that we, uh, we don't end up like other people. I did want to read something very funny uh, that Trump said. You know, when Trump, when you have to agree with Trump, it's a sign of uh, failure on, uh, on our part. Uh, this is something he said, uh, one of his tweets, uh, yesterday. He says, uh, MSDNC, we called MSNBC MSDNC, anyway, MSDNC, Comcast Slime, CNN, and others of the fake media have now added Crazy Bernie to the list of Russian sympathizers, along with Tulsi Gabbard and Jill Stein, both agents of Russia, they say. But now they report President Putin wants Bernie or me to win. The reason for this is that the do-nothing Democrats using disinformation hoax number seven don't want Bernie Sanders to get the Democratic nomination. And they figure this would be very bad for his chances. It's all rigged again against crazy Bernie Sanders. Now, he may call him crazy Bernie Sanders, but he got to the heart of it. 
and uh, why we see these uh, uh, constant, uh, this constant propaganda. So Trump is the one telling us what's what. And t people are going on Tucker Carlson on Fox News. He's telling us what's what. And Democrats are um, falling for this again. Uh, but we still have our campaigns. We are still making uh, our demands on uh, uh, those in office and those who want to be in office so that we don't see a repeat of, uh, of this behavior. And we can see the things we want so that uh, there's not one group of people with influence in Washington who um, uh, promote people being killed in uh, Gaza or Venezuela or any of the countries uh, that are being sanctioned or attacked militarily in this country. Thank you very much. Okay, well we have a lot to talk about. Um, and so let's, um, let, me, let me first pose a couple of questions from up here. Uh, and then we will go straight to, uh, to, um, to you so we can have a conversation. We know that uh, uh, Bayan has been quite clear about uh, the um, absolute necessity for framing uh, the struggle in the Philippines and really uh, by extension uh, the struggles of oppressed nations and people globally uh, as wars of, of of struggles of national liberation. How do we uh, explain, one, why this obvious fact is now part of the national discourse in the U.S. Uh, in general, uh, but why uh, this seems to escape uh, much of the, of the left, which helps to explain why we have not been as aggressive as we could be to try to make sure that this perspective was and is part of the national discourse during the electoral process. Yeah, I mean, part of it, of course, is because it's um, consciously taken out of the electoral process. Um, so for, for a lot of people who, I mean, not just talking about the left, but for the vast majority of people, um, if you're not debating about foreign policy, if the candidates aren't talking about it, then um, the people aren't going to care about it. Or they're, they're, they're being sent a message that it's not important. Um, and it, it goes along with the, I, you know, this myth of American exceptionalism that um, for some reason or another, they uh, will only just care about themselves in an election cycle, right? Um, for, for the left, um, you know, uh, it's a very complicated question. Um, uh, the, the relationship between the, the U.S. left and uh, national liberation struggles abroad, um, I think uh, they're... I mean, UNAC is a great space in terms of having a united front to be able to bring all these different stories of struggle together, um, to share more about um, what's actually happening in the countries that are being most impacted by um, US imperialism abroad. Um, uh, part of it is because, um, you know, the, even, even um, the left is not um, invincible to um, uh, propaganda about some of these countries, uh, or, um, and that propaganda might mean like, um, uh, black propaganda against uh, national liberation movements um, that paint people as like uh, dictators, terrorists, so on and so forth, or even um, uh, sometimes more sinister is the the intentional lack of uh, media attention on on certain issues. Right, um, the Philippines is a place, uh, for example, where. Um, there's uh, definitely a deliberate cover-up of what is the U.S.'s role in, in the Philippines, given that it's its first imperial project. Um, and so even for the Filipino community, there's, there's historical amnesia, um, uh, colonial amnesia, right? Um, that if for the communities that are, um, whose histories it is, of, of oppression, of exploitation, if they're not even aware of, of what these things are, uh, let alone you know the rest of the public. Um, and so I think those are, are things that um, we need to be able to, to fight more in, in terms of the election cycle and uh, putting these uh, issues on, on the table for people to talk about. And then outside of the election cycle, uh, of course, the continuous education um, among our circles, building more um, uh, spaces for United Front work where we can uh, make the links um, and actually uh, listen and learn about other struggles that um, uh, are very important in, in terms of the fight against imperialism. 
I, I'm sorry, I wanted to say one thing. I, I neglected to talk about our petition. Some of you signed it uh, yesterday, and we hope you do today. This is uh, our petition calling on elected officials to address issues of war and militarism, cutting the military budget, um, closing military bases, closing Af AFRICOM, and investigating all instances of lethal force in uh, uh, law enforcement in the U.S. So please sign this before you go. It's also on blackalliancefortpeace.com. You can see everything I talked about, our campaign, our campaign pledges, our petitions, and Julie still has some. Anyway, folks still have it. Thanks. <laughs> we'll talk about this in more detail in, in a few minutes. Uh, Margaret, I wanted to, uh, well, we could maybe touch on this um, briefly. Um, you know, we, even in this conversation this morning, we, we kind of fell into and habit of just framing the concerns around global uh, U.S. aggression um, and militarism as primarily an issue of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, but as we all know, one of the missions of the Black Alliance of Peace is to make the, uh, the connection between uh, U.S. global aggression and militarism uh, and the uh, uh, militarism uh, and state violence we have uh, domestically. Uh, can you talk to that issue? Sure. Making that connection and, and, and s can you talk to, once that connection is made, does, what does that suggest in terms of where we should as a uh, anti-imperialist movement direct our attention? What level of government or what levels of government might that approach suggests would be uh, prioritized? Well, um, we talked about uh, the military budget and the fact that uh, everybody goes along, all this al alleged opposition to Trump, but uh, as you pointed out, Adrian pointed out, a $700 billion budget passed with the help of the Democrats. Then people want to say, oh, isn't it terrible? The Republicans want to cut fill in the blank. They want to cut disability, they want to cut that benefits, how, anything, education. You can't have those things if you have a, a military budget that is 60% of uh, the federal budget. You cannot have that stuff. Uh, I think, and of course it all trickles down. So money for public housing uh, comes from the federal government, but then New York State doesn't have money, and then New York City doesn't have money, and then you have people who are uh, completely homeless or uh, not uh, living in housing they should be living in because of uh, uh, this capitulation and because of silence about uh, these people who claim to be in opposition to something else when they are not opposed. We see it uh, um, here with the, uh, the 1033 program, which uh, gives surplus military equipment to local police departments. So all over the country, they're, you know, in Podunk, wherever, there are cops who have a, a tank. They have military vehicles to, to uh, carry out their everyday work. And this is also a result. So I, every level of government, all of them, they all must be put on notice that we don't want a 233 program, no thank you. So uh, the local city council, aldermen, whatever you call them, need to be told that they can't accept it. Uh, the state legislature, laytors, can't be, um, if they claim they want to do something about homelessness, they've got to speak up. And obviously at the federal government, they have to, we have to speak up to them as well. So it's all of them. Thank you, Margaret. Well, I'm going to uh, quit trying to pretend to be uh, Glenn Ford and uh, move this to, uh, to the audience. So uh, <laughs> anybody who may have questions, please raise your hand. And Joe, what's the process with the? Yourself is going to pass around the mic. Fantastic. So I should choose or? It's uh, yeah. a heavy responsibility. <laughs> yeah, we'll do uh, two or three questions per, uh, per round. And we'll start with, with the uh, one embassy uh, defender. Hi. Um, yeah, 
I always find elections difficult to relate to because uh, it's, it's such a mirage democracy and elections are so manipulated by fear. Uh, and we know that both parties are funded by Wall Street, both support war, so it's very hard to relate to these elections. So I don't stay in the duopoly, and this whole discussion has been about the duopoly. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I, I realize it's a two-party system, and third parties will not get a fair uh, election opportunity, but what do we, how do we use the third parties that do stand for anti-war positions for the movement? Um, I, I'm working with the Howie Hawkins campaign. He's a, a Green, Green Party. Green Party candidate, and uh, he's calling for a transformation to a peace economy as part of the Green New Deal. 75% cut in the military budget, uh, and that's part of an overall lot of transitions. He would nationalize the oil and gas companies, for example. So I realize he's not going to even get in the debates because the debates are controlled as a corporation, controlled by the two parties. He's not going to get fair media shake, but how do we as a movement use candidates like that to push our agenda? Thanks. Um, check, check. I would like to just uh, make sure that we take just two more questions and move on as, uh, as soon as possible because we want to be aware and conscious uh, that, um, uh, that the People's Forum is literally only open for us today, so we want to be courteous and leave on time. Um, so just two more questions and then we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, you, hold on, you, you, Yusuf. Yeah, we, we, we have a, a time frame. Um, pre yeah, we're going to go over that a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. My name is David Rold. I'm one of the candidates for the Green Party presidential nomination. And um, I've been a supporter of Black Alliance for Peace for a couple of years. I'm, I'm not sure if I officially signed on to the, the candidate statement um, but I would like to make sure I do that today and I'm, I'm for totally eliminating the US military 100% cut not just 50% and um, I have a question for Adrian so um, Adrian I, I really appreciated your presentation and I agree with everything you said about um, Duterte being a, a tool or puppet or or ally of U.S. imperialism that he is oppressing the, the Philippine people, and um, we need to, to get rid of him. But I, I know um, some anti-imperialists who think that Duterte is anti-imperialist because he's made a lot of anti-U.S. statements and some pro-China statements, and because there's like a, a Al Qaeda type um, insert. Islamist insurgency in the Philippines that could be covertly U.S. funded, and, and um, because of because um, Duterte is is allegedly very popular in the Philippines, and so I'm wondering if you could address how to how to discuss this with somebody like that who thinks Duterte's anti-imperialist and win them around to the correct position. Thanks, Yusuf. Let's go to the front row here, and why why you moving there? Joe, what, what are we looking at in terms of the time frame? Well, it's uh, about 25 after 11. We're going to do this at 11.30. But since we're not having a meeting, we're going to have a lunch speaker. If you want to go a little bit longer, that's, that's fine with me. And then go to the workshops because we can condense lunch. Okay, so let's say we, 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 we hold it, we stop at, what, 11, 11.40? Okay. Yes. Okay, yeah, all right. 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is why UNAC cannot continue what we are doing with other countries? Iran does not have a representative um, or to U.S. government. Why can't we have their representative with us? Why can't we, when we did what, whatever you did for um, Venezuela, send a, an ambassador to Venezuela and get their ambassador to work with us and other countries. Let's do it. You did a whole lot of way. I am American Iranian citizen. I will be delegate, I will be ambassador from Iran to US or from US to Iran. I will go get the letter from Iranian government and I'll be your representative to Iranian government. Let's do that, really connect the world. This is foreign policy by implementing it. 
in Oakland, they took over the houses that was empty. Let us, this organization, and people want that. Let us take over the houses that are empty and take the people who are homeless there. And let us, let us do those actions, work, work in uniting the world together, the world that are like us. Iran is really, would love to have every one of you as U.S. representative there, and they would love to send you U.S. representative. Uh, Code Pink does that. Let's have it official, and officially have a um, ambassador from Iran, from Nicaragua, from El Salvador, from um, from uh, Venezuela, from Palestine, from Iraq, from uh, Afghanistan. Let's have that and let's send the representative there. Let's do it, really take the action and take it in control. Let's rule, let's rule our own country and millions will join you, millions. What they are doing, they are an office that are representing corporations. Let us create an office and represent American people. I have a house, I painted white, and you become president <laughs> and the White House. <laughs> we'll give it to him. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I guess I should because uh, <laughs> Bauman made me the president the other night, so. So let's, let's, let's respond quickly so we can maybe try to get one or two more questions in. So we, we have three questions. Who wants to tackle the first one regarding the role of the, of the, uh, of the third parties? Uh, yes, that's a, good, that's a good point, Kevin. Um, I think, uh, it, well, I think that that may happen this year for a, a lot of reasons anyway. But uh, uh, people uh, turn to the Greens and other parties outside of the duopoly because there's no voice. Uh, no pro-peace voice allowed within it. So that is something to be encouraged. But I, I also think the reality is everyone is not there yet. And uh, I think we can move the process along by continuing what we, uh, some of the things I've discussed uh, with those who are in office now and those who are candidates for this office now. That's something that we, I don't think we've done enough and uh, uh, I, I encourage us to do that so that uh, we can have a salute to Venezuela parade in, in New York, salute to Haiti parade or something like that, and all the elected officials will know that they'd better show up for that. Um, to respond to that question too really quickly, uh, an example from the Philippines. The Philippines actually has a block of um, very progressive um, uh, uh, representatives in the House. Um, uh, and they are closely affiliated with the National Democratic Movement. They push pro-people policies. And it's a very important tactic in the Philippines in building the opposition from within. And also we know that there are um, splits, of course, within um, reactionary classes, the, the families and dynasties in power. Um, and they're really able to maneuver in that, that field of, uh, that arena of struggle to uh, build that opposition that way. So I think it's definitely important. To, to be able to have it as an arena of struggle um, outside of that, uh, the duopoly here. Um, for the Duterte statement, um, I think, you know, just look at statements versus actions. Um, Duterte came out with a whole lot of um, anti-US uh, statements to begin with, and then slowly but surely he allowed the US military um, to stay, um, commit so many human rights violations, he still accepts the aid. Um, when the, the most recent news is that he sent a letter of termination of the Visiting Forces Agreement, which allows the, Philippine, uh, which allows the US troops to uh, stay in the Philippines. Um, the thing that w we celebrate that decision um, to terminate, but what pushed him to do that was, um, as Berna mentioned on Friday night, that there was a senator who, the senator who architected the um, drug war, his US visa was revoked. And that of all things is the tipping point, not the, the countless people who have died, not the, the environmental destruction caused by the US bases, but his, uh, his buddy who, like, whose feelings are hurt. Um, that's what caused him to, to terminate the VFA, the Visiting Forces Agreement. And so we just have to make those things clear um, to people who uh, hear him but don't study his actions.
What about that very important question around the issue of, of people's diplomacy? Uh, how do we address that? Well, yes. I don't know about painting somebody's house white and, and uh, that taking care of it. But I know, th I know there are people here who have been to Iran. I know there are people here who've been. I I've, I've was in the Philippines a, a few years ago. But I, I think we have to make, continue to make those connections uh, with people around the world so that we're not just talking to each other. And uh, I think it's a, those are learning opportunities for us. And uh, sometimes we find out that we don't know as much as we thought we knew. So it's, it's vital to talk to people on the ground. Uh, the fact that this is discouraged, the fact that it's made difficult, the fact that it's in some cases now being made impossible is very difficult to get to Venezuela. It's very difficult to go to Iran. That's another reason they sanction countries, uh, to prevent uh, people from literally from being able to communicate with each other. But that's not something that should stop us. And I, I think that is something we need to keep in mind when we plan uh, gatherings like this. And I think that it's important to point out, we talked about this yesterday in our workshop on uh, people-centered human rights, that um, um, you know, when, this, when states are unable or unwilling to uh, enforce international law to protect human rights, uh, then it falls to the people. Actually, it should be the people first anyway, because we are the source of, of sovereignty. And we talked about the fact that uh, the Embassy uh, Protectors Collective was in fact uh, a, a uh, shiny example of people's diplomacy, uh, where people step forward, <laughs> step forward to not only protect international law, but to stand in solidarity with the masses of people in uh, Venezuela. So before we close out, we, we are losing time now, uh, I want to do one quick thing. Uh, can you pull back up the image from the, uh, the pledge form, please? So that we, can, um, we can address, um, in the last few minutes, some of the still outstanding questions we have around how we, in fact, utilize the electoral process uh, in a progressive way to advance uh, our concerns, to advance uh, an anti-war, anti-imperialist agenda. Uh, so just very briefly, I think it's important that people understand what we're trying to do. This is a, a campaign that we are asking everybody to participate in. We have a set of, I think, ver we think very clear demands that makes the connections between the various issues that we think should be raised. We say that any candidate or any elected representative must take a stance on this, these positions. So we say very clearly, you've got to support efforts to cut the military budget by at least 50% and to use those resources to address the objective human rights needs of the people in education, jobs, et cetera, et cetera, okay? We say you've got to oppose the militarization of the police, specifically the Department of Defense 1033 program, the program primarily responsible for militarizing the police. In that, we have other kinds of, of issues the Israeli training of police forces. And now, how many people heard of Operation Relentless Pursuit? Raise your hand. A few people. The, the new Trump uh, war on crime, which we know means a war on us as African people, as brown people in this country, oppressed nationalities. So we say uh, any person who is an elected official or has aspirations to be one, you've got to sign on to this position. You've got to promote the closure of these 800 forward deployment bases, these offensive imperialist bases. There's no discussion about that. You've got to oppose these bases, and you've got to commit yourself to closing down this white supremacist structure called NATO. Close AFRICOM. Close this backward offensive command structure on the African continent. You've got to oppose that. You've got to work to call for that. You've got to demand that the state, the Department of Justice, 
investigate all of the uh, lethal force uh, uh, incidents here in this country. Okay? Uh, investigations that have been called for for the last 15, almost 20 years by various United Nations agencies. You've got to stand for that and demand that that happens. You've got to commit to passing resolutions at every level of government that commits the U.S. to upholding international law and the United Nations Charter and to oppose all military economic, including sanctions and blockades that are acts of war and political interventions in the internal affairs of sovereign nations. You've got to stand for that. If not, we're not going to support you. And then we say we want to sponsor legislation at every level of government that calls on the U.S. to support the resolution passed by the United Nations, representing the vast majority of the population on this planet, that's calling for the complete abolishment of nuclear weapons. These are minimal demands that we say that they have to represent a demand, a, a peace program, if you will. And if you're not willing to support these, you should not expect any support from the anti-war and anti-imperialist community. <laughs> so we are calling on everybody. We'll talk about this again, Joe, when we get to the uh, uh, part of the agenda today. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, programs going forward. We want everybody here to, in to go to the Black Alliance of Peace website uh, and to endorse this campaign, one, and secondly, to, 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 to pull down this form, pull down the petition, or use the petition, we're telling pe the, the population to demand uh, that uh, these elected officials and candidates commit themselves to these principles. So. We want to see this come out of this gathering this weekend as a concrete uh, manifestation, a concrete action, a strategic plan for how we try to penetrate the noise here in this country and raise up these issues that we, uh, we say has to be raised uh, here in this country. So, folks, uh, I think I'm, what time? Yeah, we're it, yeah. So, we have to close this out, so I'm going to ask very briefly for our two presenters to give us one minute summation, last uh, <laughs> uh, comments, and we'll close out. Okay. I don't, I, uh, in uh, deference to the time, I'm not going to add anything to what you just said, Ajamu. Everyone go to the blackallianceforpeace.com website and uh, join all our campaigns, sign everything we have there, print everything we have there, and uh, make sure that uh, your local elected officials uh, get these and that we uh, express these demands. Um, yeah, visit Anak Bayan on social media, um, our website as well. You can find out more about the organization, the work we're doing. Uh, I'd also say uh, check out the International League of People's Struggles uh, and their Youth Commission. Um, which I ILPS is here, but uh, Anak Bain is on the steering committee of their youth commission, which uh, links up, in terms of people's diplomacy, links up um, youth, anti-imperialist youth organizations from around the world so that when elections come up as an issue, we can go to those countries and see, um, you know, what are they saying about what's going on in the U.S. as well. Let's thank our panelists, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, so, for the workshop, how he was asked about uh, Trump's assassination of Soleimani, uh, the Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, and he repeats the same lies.